Coffee Break Collection 15, The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An account of several workhouses for employing and maintaining the poor published in seventeen twenty five limehouse hamlet stepney june seventeen twenty four here is a very handsome and commodious brick house built twenty five years since for lodging the poor of this hamlet but was not applied to the present use till after the act of the ninth of king george was passed to encourage the setting up of workhouses when by a subscription among the principal inhabitants it was fitted up to receive the poor and was opened april twenty eighth seventeen twenty four the number of poor now in it are as follows twenty three men and women seven boys and girls in all thirty above half of them are unfit for labor but about a dozen of them are employed in picking oakum at which they earn about four or five shillings a week in the whole which is applied toward the maintenance of the house note well old ropes are bought for five shillings the hundred weight and the oakum is sold for twelve shillings the hundred weight the steward of the house is a pensioner of the hamlet and is allowed five pounds four shillings per annum beside his maintenance and lodging etc in the house but the principal care is in eight trustees and a cashier some of whom visit the house constantly once sometimes twice a week buy provisions and give all other necessary directions as to diet they have flesh four times a week and with it such roots as are in season and the steward having been a seafaring person feeds them after the method used on shipboard that is by joining four of them in a mess and the meat is boiled in three pound pieces one of which is a mess for four persons and the same course is observed for milk bread beer etc by this rate a poor person is maintained at the rate of two shillings ten pennies or three shillings per week including all petty disbursements and incidental charges even firing and lodging not excepted for the hamlet pay ten pounds per annum ground rent the children in this house are all young and helpless and therefore are sent to a school in the neighborhood at the public charge till they are eight years of age and then they are bound out apprentices till the age of twenty-four according to the act of parliament note well this hamlet with some addition will become a distinct parish as soon as the church now building is finished end of an account of several workhouses for employing and maintaining the poor published in seventeen twenty five coffee break collection fifteen the world of work this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org Recording by Devorah Allen Bad Case of Ergophobia Men in England even went to sleep while being sentenced. Special Cable to the New York Times London, October 12th Some Britons believe this tight little island holds a record that even America will not dispute, that of possessing the laziest man in the world, in the person of one Chilcot, who the other day slept peacefully in the dock of a London suburban criminal court, while the presiding justice considered what he should do with him. After being loudly asked several times if he had anything to say, he opened one eye reproachfully at the recorder, yawned, sighed, no, and relapsed into slumber. On one occasion Chilcott was heard to say that he had never done a voluntary hour's work in his life. This oratical effort so fatigued him, he did not utter a word for the rest of the day. 
His conversation usually consists of reluctant yeses and noes, and he is the despair of nearly every workhouse master in the country. He was examined by Dr. Wilson, who diagnosed the disease which had attacked him as ergophobia, fear of work. Chilcott, for three months past, has been under remand at the Wandsworth Jail, where the officials have had great difficulty in inducing him even to move. He is a big, heavy man. The prosecuting counsel said the prisoner was so lazy that he would not take the trouble to walk, and had to be pushed about, even had to be pushed into the dock. Chilcott was awakened to hear the recorder sentence him, but as the magistrate began to read him a lecture, he dropped off to sleep before he heard that he had been condemned to twelve months' imprisonment with hard labor. End of Bad Case of Ergophobia Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In a Coal Mine by Eva March Tappan Did you ever wonder how beds of coal happened to be in the earth? This is their story. Centuries ago, so many thousand centuries that even the most learned men can only guess at their number, strange things were coming to pass. The air was so moist and cloudy that the sun's rays had hard work to get through. It was warm, nevertheless, for the crust of the earth was not nearly so thick as it is now, and much heat came from the earth itself. Many plants and trees grow best in warm, moist air, and such plants flourished in those days. Some of their descendants are living now, but they are dwarfs, while their ancestors were giants. There is a little horsetail growing in our meadow, and there are ferns and club mosses almost everywhere. These are some of the descendants, but many of their ancestors were forty or fifty feet high. They grew very fast, especially in swamps, and when they died, there was no lack of others to take their places. Dead leaves fell and heaped up around them. Stumps stood and decayed, just as they do in our forest today. Every year the soft, black, decaying mass grew deeper. As the crust of the earth was so thin, it bent and wrinkled easily. It often sank in one place and rose in another. When these low, swampy places sank, water rushed over them, pressing down upon them with a great weight and sweeping in sand and clay. Now if you burn a heap of wood in the open air, the carbon in the wood burns and only a pile of ashes remain. Burning means that the carbon in the wood unites with the oxygen gas in the air. If you cover the wood before you light it, so that only a little oxygen reaches it, much of the carbon is left, in the form of charcoal. When wood decays, its carbon unites with the oxygen in the air, and so decay is really a sort of burning. In the forests of today, the leaves, and at length the trees themselves, fall and decay in the open air. But at the time when our coal was forming, the water kept the air away, and much carbon was left. This is the way coal was made. Some of the layers, or strata, are fifty or sixty feet thick, and some are hardly thicker than paper. On top of each one is a stratum of sandstone, or dark grey shale, this was made by the sand and mud which were brought in by the water. These shaly rocks split easily into sheets and show beautiful fossil impressions of ferns. There are also impressions of the bark and fruit of trees, together with shells, crinoids, corals, remains of fishes and flying lizards, and some few trilobites, crab-like animals with a shell somewhat like the back of a lobster, but marked into three divisions or lobes, from which its name comes. Since the crust of the earth was so thin and yielding, it wrinkled up as the earth cooled, much as the skin of an apple wrinkles when the apple dries. This brought some of the strata of coal to the surface, and after a while people discovered that it would burn. If a vein of coal cropped out on a man's farm, he broke some of it up with his pickaxe, shoveled it into his wheelbarrow, and wheeled it home. After a while, hundreds of thousands of people wanted coal, and now it had to be mined. In some places, the coal stratum was horizontal and cropped out on the side of a hill, 
so that a level road could be dug straight into it. In other places, the coal was so near the surface that it could be quarried under the open sky, just as granite is quarried. Generally, however, if you wish to visit a coal mine, you go to a shaft, a square black well sometimes deeper than the height of three or four ordinary church steeples. You get into the cage, a great steel box, and are lowered down, down, down. At last the cage stops and you are at the bottom of the mine. The miner's faces, hands, overalls are all black with coal dust. They wear tiny lamps on their caps, and as they come near the walls of coal, it sparkles as it catches the light. Here and there hangs an electric lamp. It is doing its best to drive out light, but its glass is thick with coal dust. The low roof is held up by stout wooden timbers and pillars of coal. A long passageway stretches off into a blacker darkness than you ever dreamed of. Suddenly there is a blaze of red light far down the passage, a roar, a medley of all sorts of noises, the rattling of chains, the clattering of couplings, the shouts of men, the crash of coal falling into the bins. It is a locomotive dragging its line of cars loaded with coal. In a few minutes it rushes back with empty cars to have them refilled. All along this passageway are rooms, that is, chambers, which have been made by digging out the coal. Above them is a vast amount of earth and rock, sometimes hundreds of feet in thickness. There is always danger that the roof will cave in, and so the rooms are not made large, and great pillars of coal are left to hold up the roof. Not many years ago the miner used to do all the work with his muscles. Now machines do most of it. The miner then had to lie down on his side near the wall of coal in his room and cut into it, close to the floor, as far as his pickaxe would reach. Then he bored a hole into the top of the coal, pushed in a cartridge, thrust in a slender squib, lighted it and ran for his life. The cartridge exploded and perhaps a ton or two of coal fell. The miner's helper shoveled this into a car and pushed it out of the room to join the long string of cars. That is the way mining used to be done. In these days, a man with a small machine for cutting coal comes first. He puts his cutter on the floor against the wall of coal and turns on the electricity. Chip, chip, grinds the machine, eating its way swiftly into the coal, and soon there is a deep cut all along the side of the room. The man and his machine go elsewhere, and the first room is left for its next visitors. They come in the evening and bore holes for the blasting. Once these holes were bored by hand, but now they are made with powerful drills that work by compressed air. A little later other men come and set off cartridges. In the morning when the dust has settled and the smoke has blown away, the loaders appear with their shovels and load the coal into the cars. Then it is raised to the surface and made ready for market. Did you ever notice that some pieces of coal are dull and smutty, while others are hard and bright? The dull coal is called bituminous, because it contains more bitumen or mineral pitch. This is often sold as run-of-the-mine coal, that is, just as it comes out from the mine, whether in big pieces or in little ones. But sometimes it is passed over screens, and in this process the dust and smaller bits drop out. The second kind of coal, the sort that is hard and bright, is anthracite. Its name is connected with a Greek word meaning ruby. It burns with a glow, but does not blaze. Most of the anthracite coal is used in houses, and householders will not buy it unless the pieces are of nearly the same size and free from dirt, coal dust, and slate. The work of preparation is done in odd-shaped buildings called breakers. One part of a breaker is often a hundred or a hundred and fifty feet in height. The coal is carried to the top of the breaker. From there it makes a journey to the ground, but something happens to it every little way. It goes between rollers which crush it, then over screens through which the smaller pieces fall. Sometimes the screens are so made that the coal will pass over them, while the thin, flat pieces of slate will fall through. In spite of all this, bits of coal mixed with slate sometimes slide down with the coal, and these are picked out by boys. A better way of getting rid of them is now coming into use. 
This is to put the coal and slate into moving water. The slate is heavier than the coal and sinks, and so the coal can easily be separated from it. Dealers have names for the various sizes of coal. Egg must be between two and two and five eighths inches in diameter. Nut between three fourths and one and one eighth inches. P between one half and three fourths of an inch. Mining coal is dangerous work. Any blow of the pickaxe may break into a vein of water which will burst out and flood the mine. The wood props which support the roof may break, or the pillars of coal may not be large enough, and the roof may fall in and crush the workers. There are always poisonous gases. The coal, as has been said before, was made under water, and therefore the gas which was formed in the decaying leaves and wood could not escape. It is always bubbling out from the coal, and at any moment a pickaxe may break into the hole that is full of it. One kind of gas is called choke damp, because it chokes or suffocates anyone who breathes it. There is also white damp, the gas which you see burning with a pretty blue flame over a hot coal fire. Worst of all is the fire damp. If you stir up the water in a marsh, you will see bubbles of it rise to the surface. It is harmless in a marsh, but quite the opposite in a mine. When it unites with a certain amount of air, it becomes explosive, and the least bit of flame will cause a terrible explosion. Even coal dust may explode if the air is full of it, and it is suddenly set in motion by too heavy a blast of powder. Miners used to work by candlelight. Everyone knew how dangerous this was, but no one found any better way until, about a hundred years ago, Sir Humphrey Davy noticed something which other people had not observed. He discovered that flame would not pass through fine wire gauze, and he made a safety lamp in which a little oil lamp was placed in a round funnel of wire gauze. The light, but not the flame, would pass through it, and all safety lamps that burn oil have been made on this principle. The electric lamp, however, is now in general use. The miner wears it on his cap, and between his shoulders he carries a small, light storage battery. Even with safety lamps, however, there are sometimes explosions. The only way to make a mine at all safe from dangerous gases is to keep it full of fresh, pure air. There is no wind to blow through the chambers and passages, and therefore air has to be forced in. One way is to keep a large fire at the bottom of the air shaft. If you stand on a stepladder, you will feel that the top of the room is much warmer than the floor. This is because hot air rises, and in a mine, the hot air over the fire rises and sucks the foul air and gas out of the mine, and fresh air rushes in to take its place. Another way is by a fan, a machine that forces fresh air into the mine. So it is that by hard work and much danger we get coal for burning. Now coal is dirty and heavy, a coal fire is hard to kindle and hard to put out, and the ashes are decidedly disagreeable to handle. And, after all, we do not really burn the coal itself, but only the gas from it, which results from the union of carbon and oxygen. In some places, natural gas, as it is called, which comes directly from some storehouse in the ground, is used in stoves and furnaces and fireplaces for both heating and cooking. And perhaps before long, gas will be manufactured so cheaply and can be used so safely and comfortably that we shall not have to burn coal at all, but can use gas for all purposes, unless electricity should take its place. End of In a Coal Mine by Eva March Tappan Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Robinson Development of the Phonograph at Alexander Graham Bell's Volta Laboratory by Leslie J. Newville The fame of Thomas A. Edison rests most securely on his genius for making practical application of the ideas of others. However, it was Alexander Graham Bell long a Smithsonian regent and friend of its third secretary, S. P. Langley, who, with his Volta Laboratory associates, made practical the phonograph, 
which has been called Edison's most original invention. The author, Leslie J. Newville, wrote this paper while he was attached to the Office of the Curator of Science and Technology in the Smithsonian Institution's United States National Museum. The story of Alexander Graham Bell's invention of the telephone has been told and retold. How he became involved in the difficult task of making practical phonograph records and succeeded in association with Charles Sumner Tainter and Chichester Bell is not so well known. But material collected through the years by the U.S. National Museum of the Smithsonian Institution now makes clear how Bell and two associates took Edison's tinfoil machine and made it reproduce sound from wax instead of tinfoil. They began their work in Washington, D.C. in 1879 and continued until granted basic patents in 1886 for recording in wax. Preserved at the Smithsonian are some 20 pieces of experimental apparatus, including a number of complete machines. Their first experimental machine was sealed in a box and deposited in the Smithsonian Archives in 1881. The others were delivered by Alexander Graham Bell to the National Museum in two lots in 1915 and 1922. Bell was an old man by this time, busy with his aeronautical experiments in Nova Scotia. It was not until 1947, however, that the museum received the key to the experimental gramophones, as they were called, to differentiate them from the Edison machine. In that year, Mrs. Laura F. Tainter donated to the museum ten bound notebooks, along with Tainter's unpublished autobiography. This material describes in detail the strange machines and even stranger experiments, which led in 1886 to a greatly improved phonograph. Thomas A. Edison had invented the phonograph in 1877, but the fame bestowed on Edison for this startling invention, sometimes called his most original, was not due to its efficiency. Recording with the tinfoil phonograph is too difficult to be practical. The tinfoil tears easily, and even when the stylus is properly adjusted, the reproduction is distorted and squeaky, and good for only a few playbacks. Nevertheless, young Edison, the wizard as he was called, had hit upon a secret of which men had dreamed for centuries. Immediately after this discovery, however, he did not improve it, allegedly because of an agreement to spend the next five years developing the New York City electric light and power system. Meanwhile, Bell, always a scientist and experimenter at heart, after his invention of the telephone in 1876, was looking for new worlds to conquer. If we accept Tainter's version of the story, it was through Gardner Green Hubbard that Bell took up the phonograph challenge. Bell had married Hubbard's daughter, Mabel, in 1879. Hubbard was then president of the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company, and his organization, which had purchased the Edison patent, was having trouble with its finances because people did not like to buy a machine which seldom worked well and proved difficult for an unskilled person to operate. In 1879, Hubbard got Bell interested in improving the machine, and it was agreed that a laboratory should be set up in Washington. Experiments were also to be conducted in the transmission of sound by light, and this resulted in the selenium cell photophone, patented in 1881. Both the Hubbards and the Bells decided to move to the capital. While Bell took his bride to Europe for an extended honeymoon, his associate, Charles Sumner Tainter, a young instrument maker, was sent on to Washington from Cambridge, Massachusetts to start the laboratory. Bell's cousin, Chichester Bell, who had been teaching college chemistry in London, agreed to come as the third associate. During his stay in Europe, Bell received a 50,000 franc, $10,000, Volta Prize, and it was with this money that the Washington Project, the Volta Laboratory Association, was financed. A description of the procedure used is found on page 67 of Tainter's unpublished autobiography. There, Tainter quotes Chichester Bell as follows. Quote, a gel of bichromate of potash solution, vibrated by the voice, was directed against a glass plate immediately in front of a slit, on which light was concentrated by means of a lens. The jet was so arranged that the light on its way to the slit had to pass through the nap, and as the thickness of this was constantly changing, the illumination of the slit was also varied. By means of a lens, an image of this slit was thrown upon the rotating gelatin bromide plate, on which, accordingly, a record of the voice vibrations was obtained." Unquote. Tainter's story in his autobiography of the establishment of the laboratory shows its comparative simplicity. I therefore wound up my business affairs in Cambridge, packed up all of my tools and machines, and went to Washington, 
and after much search, rented a vacant house on L Street between 13th and 14th Streets, and fitted it up for our purposes. The Smithsonian Institution sent us over a mail sack of scientific books from the library of the institution to consult, and, primed with all we could learn, we went to work. We were like the explorers in an entirely unknown land, where one has to select the path that seems to be the most likely to get you to your destination, with no knowledge of what is ahead. In conducting our work, we had first to design an experimental apparatus, then hunt about, often in Philadelphia and New York, for the materials with which to construct it, which were usually hard to find, and finally build the models we needed ourselves. The experimental machines built at the Volta Laboratory included both disc and cylinder types, and an interesting tape recorder. The records used with the machines and now in the collections of the U.S. National Museum are believed to be the oldest reproducible records preserved anywhere in the world. While some are scratched and cracked, others are still in good condition. By 1881, the Volta Associates had succeeded in improving an Edison tinfoil machine to some extent. Wax was put in the grooves of the heavy iron cylinder, and no tinfoil was used. Rather than apply for a patent at that time, however, they deposited the machine in a sealed box at the Smithsonian and specified that it was not to be opened without the consent of two of the three men. In 1937, Tainter was the only one still living, so the box was opened with his permission. For the occasion, the heirs of Alexander Graham Bell gathered in Washington, but Tainter was too old and too ill to come from San Diego. The sound vibrations had been indented in the wax which had been applied to the Edison phonograph. The following is the text of the recording. Quote, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamed of in your philosophy. I am a gramophone, and my mother was a phonograph. Unquote. Remarked Mrs. Gilbert Grosvenor, Bell's daughter, when the box was opened in 1837, quote, That is just the sort of thing father would have said. He was always quoting from the classics. Unquote. The method of reproduction used on the machine, however, is even more interesting than the quotation. Rather than a stylus and diaphragm, a jet of air under high pressure was used. Quote, this evening about 7 p.m., Tainter noted on July 7, 1881, the apparatus being ready, the valve upon the top of the air cylinder was opened slightly until a pressure of about 100 pounds was indicated by the gauge. The phonograph cylinder was then rotated, and the sounds produced by the escaping air could be heard, and the words understood a distance of at least eight feet from the phonograph. Unquote. The point of the jet is glass, and could be directed at a single groove. The other experimental gramophones indicate an amazing range of experimentation. While the method of cutting a record on wax was the one later exploited commercially, everything else seems to have been tried at least once. The following was noted on Wednesday, March 20, 1881. Quote, a fountain pen is attached to a diaphragm so as to be vibrated in a plane parallel to the axis of a cylinder. The ink used in this pen to contain iron in a finely divided state, and the pen caused to trace a spiral line around the cylinder as it turned. The cylinder to be covered with a sheet of paper upon which the record is made. This ink can be rendered magnetic by means of a permanent magnet. The sounds were to be reproduced by simply substituting a magnet for the fountain pen. Unquote. The result of these ideas for magnetic reproduction resulted in patent 341287, granted on May 4, 1886. It deals solely with the, quote, reproduction through the action of magnetism of sounds by means of records in solid substances. Unquote. The air jet used in reproducing has already been described. Other jets of molten metal, wax, and water were also tried. On Saturday, May 19, 1883, Tainter wrote, Made the following experiment today. The cylinder of the Edison photograph was covered with a coating of paraffin wax and then turned off true and smooth. A cutting style, A, secured by the end of a lever, B, was then adjusted over the cylinder as shown. Lever B was pivoted at the points C, D, and the only pressure exerted to force the style into the wax was due to the weight of the parts. Upon the top of A was fixed a small brass disc, and immediately over it a sensitive water jet adjusted, so that the stream of water at its sensitive part fell upon the center of the brass disc. The phonograph cylinder, E, was rotated while words and sounds were shouted to the support to which the water jet was attached, and a record that was quite visible to the unaided eye was the result. The tape recorder, an unusual instrument which recorded mechanically on a 3 inch strip of wax-covered paper, is one of the machines described and illustrated in U.S. Patent 341214, dated May 4, 1886. 
The strip was coated by dipping it in a solution of beeswax and paraffin, one part white beeswax, two parts paraffin by weight, then scraping one side clean and allowing the other side to harden. The machine of sturdy wood and metal construction is hand-powered by means of a knob fastened to the flywheel. From the flywheel, shaft power is transferred by a small friction wheel to a vertical shaft. At the bottom of the shaft, a V-pulley transfers motion by belts to corresponding V-pulleys beneath the horizontal reels. The wax strip passes from one 8-inch reel around the periphery of a pulley with guided flanges, mounted above the V-pulleys on the main vertical shaft, where it comes in contact with the recording or reproducing stylus. It is then taken up on the other reel. The sharp recording stylus, actuated by a vibrating mica diaphragm, cuts the wax from the strip. In reproducing, a dull, loosely mounted stylus attached to a rubber diaphragm carried sounds through an ear tube to the listener. Both recording and reproducing heads, mounted alternately on the same two posts, could be adjusted vertically so that several records could be cut on the same 3 16 inch strip. While this machine was never developed commercially, it is an interesting ancestor of the modern tape recorder, which it resembles somewhat in design. How practical it was, or just why it was built, we do not know. The tape is now brittle, the heavy paper reels warped, and the reproducing head missing. Otherwise, with some reconditioning, it could be put into working condition. Most of the disc machines designed by the Volta Associates had the disc mounted vertically. The explanation is that in the early experiments, the turntable with disc was mounted on the shop lathe, along with the recording and reproducing heads. Later, when the complete models were built, most of them featured vertical turntables. An interesting exception has a horizontal 7-inch turntable. This machine, although made in 1886, is a duplicate of one made earlier but taken to Europe by Chichester Bell. Tainter was granted U.S. Patent 385886 for it on July 10, 1888. The playing arm is rigid except for a pivoted vertical motion of 90 degrees to allow removal of the record or a return to the starting position. While recording or playing, the record not only rotated, but moved laterally under the stylus, which thus described a spiral, recording 150 grooves to the inch. The Bell and Tainter records preserved at the Smithsonian are both of the lateral cut and Hill and Dale types. Edison, for many years, used the Hill and Dale method with both cylinder and disc records, and Emil Berliner is credited with the invention of the lateral cut gramophone record in 1887. The Volta Associates, however, had been experimenting with both types as early as 1881, as is shown by the following quotation from Tainter. The record on the electrotype in the Smithsonian package is of the other form, where the vibrations are impressed parallel to the surface of the recording material, as was done in the Old Scott phonograph of 1857, thus forming a groove of uniform depth but of wavy character, in which the sides of the groove act upon the tracing point instead of the bottom, as is the case of the vertical type. This form we named the zigzag form, and referred to it in that way in our notes. Its important advantage in guiding the reproducing needle I first called attention to in the note on page 9, volume 1, Home Notes on March 29, 1881, and endeavored to use it in my early work, but encountered so much difficulty in getting a form of reproducer that would work with the soft wax records without tearing the groove, we used the hill and valley type of record more often than the other. In 1885, when the Volta Associates were sure that they had a number of practical inventions, they filed applications for patents. They also began to look around for investors. After giving several demonstrations in Washington, they gained the necessary support, and the American Gramophone Company was organized to manufacture and sell the machines. The Volta Gramophone Company was formed to control the patents. The Howe Sewing Machine Factory at Bridgeport, Connecticut became the American Gramophone Plant. Tainter went there to supervise the manufacturing, and continued his inventive work for many years. This Bridgeport plant is still in use today by a successor firm, the Dictaphone Corporation. The work of the Volta Associates laid the foundation for the successful use of the dictating machine in business, for their wax recording process was practical and their machines sturdy. But it was to take several more years and the renewed work of Edison and further developments by Berliner and many others before the talking machine industry really got underway and became a major factor in home entertainment. End of Development of the Phonograph at Alexander Graham Bell's Volta Laboratory Recording by Robert Robinson Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Recording by Nemo. The Revelation by Robert W. Service. The same old sprint in the morning, boys, to the same old din and smut, chained all day to the same old desk, down in the same old rut, posting the same old greasy books, catching the same old train. Oh, how will I manage to stick it all if I ever get back again? We've bidden goodbye to a life in a cage. We're finished with pushing a pen. They're pumping us full of bellicose rage. They're showing us how to be men. We're only beginning to find ourselves. We're wonders of brawn in thew. But when we go back to our sissy jobs, oh, what are we going to do? For shoulders curved with a counter stoop will be carried erect and square, and faces white from the office light will be bronzed by the open air, and we'll walk with a stride of a newborn pride with a new found joy in our eyes, scornful men who have diced with death under the naked skies. And when we get back to the dreary grind in the bald headed boss's call, don't you think that the dingy window blind and the dingier office wall will suddenly melt to a vision of space of violent flame scarred night? Then, oh, the joy of the danger thrill, and oh, the roar of the fight. Don't you think as we pedal a cart of pins, the counter will fade away? And again we'll be seeing the sandbag rims and the barb wire's misty gray. As a flat voice asks for a pound of tea, don't you fancy we'll hear instead the night wind moan in the soothing drone of the packet that's overhead? Don't you guess that the things we're seeing now will haunt us through all the years? Heaven and hell rolled into one, glory and blood and tears life's pattern picked with a scarlet thread where once we wove with a gray to remind us all how we played our part in the shock of an epic day oh we're booked for the great adventure now we're pledged to the real romance we'll find ourselves or we'll lose ourselves somewhere in giddy old france we'll know the zest of the fighter's life the best that we have will give we'll hunger and thirst we'll die but first we'll live by the gods we'll live we'll breathe free air and we'll bivouac under the starry sky we'll march with men and we'll fight with men and we'll see men laugh and die we'll know such joys we never dreamed we'll fathom the deeps of pain but the hardest bit of it all will be when we come back home again for some of us smirk in a chiffon shop and some of us teach in a school some of us help with the seat of our pants to polish an office stool the merits of somebody's soap or jam some of us seek to explain but all of us wonder what we'll do when we have to go back again end of the revelation Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Excerpt from The Right to Work by John Elliott Ross, 1884 1946. Published in 1917 recently there appeared in one of our big dailies a cartoon poignantly depicting the beginning and the end of unemployment two ragged men sat on a bench in a public square one slouches down upon the seat his ears drawn into his collar his hands in his pockets a perfect portrayal of the man who has given up the fight the other has not sunk so far he is leaning forward his face in his hands his attitude not yet one of unresentful impotence his companion says cheer up bo think of the men in the trenches and the reply eloquently voices the suffering of the self-respecting unemployed 
huh they've got a chance to be shot there is some hope for the man who would rather die than endure his existence unworthy of a man he still has some fight in him if a lifeline can be thrown him he will be saved but the man who ceased to desire to work is hopeless all internal resistance has been broken down no vestige of self-respect or backbone is left if he is to be saved it must be from outside and by being built up anew but there are still blacker shadows to this picture if it were merely a question of two million men more or less responsible for their own fate sinking into this demoralized condition it would be serious enough they might reasonably expect christians with a command laid upon them to love their neighbor as themselves to do something to help them but unfortunately these men are not simply dropping back themselves they are pulling others with them millions of dependent women and children are being dragged into the slough of despond because the heads of families are no longer able to cope with the problem of support wives are forced out into casual employment home duties neglected children run wild or have their lives ground out in soul and body destroying toil we have heard much recently of the horrible evils of child and woman labor thousands of children are stunted in mind and body because they must take their place in industry before their time children have actually been killed by excessive work in factories and others who do not go to work have hardly a better fate in every school in the poorer districts of our cities you can see the pinched and sallow faces the spindle legs bespeaking slow starvation women too at the most critical periods when other lives are depending so directly upon theirs are compelled to such heavy labor as saps not only their own vitality but the strength of the coming generation how can they possibly nourish two on what is not sufficient for one how can children born into such conditions be anything but weak and sickly and fretful directly or indirectly unemployment is responsible for all these ills for even when the head of the family has work it is the fear of unemployment that makes him accept less than a living wage and then drives his wife and children to eke out his pittance with their own this is the sword of democles that is constantly over the helpless working man's head he does not know at what moment it may fall to maim forever not only himself but also his loved ones but this does not exhaust the evils of unemployment like some great octopus it is reaching out its fearful tentacles to draw millions upon millions into its greedy maw it is not content with its immediate victims and their dependents but it poisons the life of the whole community obviously the good samaritan is affected for whence come the food and clothing and shelter that the idle need these men must be supported in some way if there were two million men idle last winter then for every day of idleness at least two million dollars in wages are lost and while naturally this huge army does not spend as much in times of idleness as it did when employed nevertheless it must need tremendous sums for its support some of this money comes from past savings but much must also come from those who are still employed the longer idleness continues the more of a burden does this army of unemployed become yet another loss to the community is derived from the fact that if these men had continued working they would have added to the wealth of the nation about two and one-half times their wages that is to say if their wages would have been a billion dollars the total product of their labor would have been worth before deducting their pay three and one-half billions such a loss of national wealth would be serious under any conditions but it is doubly serious when we are paying a fuel bill as it were to burn it up 
if a fire or earthquake or flood were to destroy this much wealth every paper in the country would deplore it why then do we calmly ignore this much worse condition which yearly engulfs not alone material wealth but the very life's blood of the nation in ruined manhood and womanhood and childhood again the business men who have to bear the burden of charity to support these unemployed must do so from decreased resources because of the lessened purchasing power of the public no man can prosper in business unless his neighbor prospers too the merchant is engaged in selling and the greater his neighbor's power to pay the more he can sell the corner groceryman realizes this well he knows that if his patrons are out of work his bills will be unpaid and others are affected similarly though not so visibly inability to sell reacts too upon the wages of employees as well as upon the profits of employers so that the effects of unemployment reaches all classes the working men employed the merchant the good samaritan the priest and the levite still further the fact that two million persons are consuming without producing means that the cost of living will rise for prices will be higher than they would be were the supply increased by the possible product of all these idle workers there is then no way in which any one can pass by on the other side of these unfortunates whether or not their hearts are touched with christian charity the blight of their brother's misfortune will shadow their fortune only the very few such as loan sharks who make a business of preying upon the poor can profit by large masses being out of work all legitimate business suffers directly or indirectly it has frequently been said that each workman in europe is carrying a soldier on his back but it is a vigorous soldier who can be of some use to his country with us the workers are carrying an army on their backs but it is a helpless a useless a vicious consuming and non-producing army that can do the country no good under any conditions it is almost as if each laborer were carrying a foreign invading soldier on their back we have often heard it said during the present war that europe has reverted to barbarism other people are aghast at the destruction of life and property going on abroad they thank god that they are not as other men that they have more christian charity more love for their brothers than to indulge in such senseless slaughter yet it might be better for us to stand afar off in the temple and strike our breasts while asking god to be merciful to us sinners for the comparison is not entirely to our credit the soldier dies with an ideal in his heart with love for his country and his hearth with his manhood intact our poor ragged soldier does not perhaps lose his life he loses only his self-respect his manhood his faith in his fellow man his faith in god in this army of ours there is none of the morale that comes from discipline none of the spiritual exaltation that is induced by consecration to a cause none of the confidence and efficiency inspired by trusted leaders our soldier has strength but is forbidden to use it has protectiveness that is turned to bitter raging impotence he has skill which is lost in the gradual relaxation of physical and moral fibre his vision becomes shifty his muscles relaxed his will feeble and if he does not escape in time it will take a miracle to save him almost literally he will have to be born again if he is to be redeemed End of excerpt from right to work Coffee Break Collection 15. The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
the round-up from boy ranchers on the trail by willard f baker come on nought it's your turn to cut out the next one i suppose i make a mux of it bud shucks you won't do that you've roped a calf before yes but not at a big round-up like this if i make a fizzle the fellows will give me the laugh what if they do everybody knows you haven't been at it long and you've got to make a start besides anybody's likely to make a mistake that's why they put rubbers on the end of pencils ride in now and snake out the next one nought all right bud here goes blaze the pony nought shannon was riding toward the bunch of cattle gathered at diamond x ranch for the big spring round-up leaped forward at the sound of his master's voice and in response to the little jerk of the reins and the clap of heels against his sides into the herd of milling turning and twisting cattle the intelligent animal made his way needing hardly any guidance from nought the lad by a mere touch corrected the course of blaze slightly and in a moment he was heading for a calf which bawled loudly get him nought cried a voice from among the cowboys looking on don't get me fussed dick nought shouted back to his brother who sat astride his pony near bud merkel it'll be your turn next into the herd he wormed his way on blaze dodging here and there but with his eyes ever on the calf he'd hoped to cut out so it could be branded nought leaned forward in his saddle and then his cousin and brother eagerly watching from outside the herd saw the boy rancher's hand shoot up through the air the rope went turning twisting writhing and uncoiling like a snake in an instant it had flipped around the hind legs of a calf good yelled dick even babe couldn't a done better complimented bud enthusiastically tis an over yet gasped nought for he had hard work ahead of him and the dust raised by thousands of hoofs was choking wait till i get it to the branding corral he leaned over in his other stirrup causing the lariat to pull taut and the next instant the calf flopped on its side snake him out blaze cried nought to his pony and the animal turned and dragged the prostrate calf along over the ground an operation not as cruel as it sounds as the surface was inches thick in soft dust like flour that's the boy nought called his cousin bud i knew you could do it now then dick let's see how you'll make out i can't throw a rope as good as nought answered the stouter lad as he urged his pony blackie into the herd but here goes meanwhile nought had dragged the calf he had cut out to the corral where the branding was going on two cowboys stationed there for the purpose leaped forward and threw the calf over on its side for it had managed to struggle to its feet when nought ceased dragging it one man twisted a front leg of the struggling creature back in a hammerlock and knelt on its neck the other took hold of the upper hind leg and with this hold prevented the calf from sprawling along on the ground sit on him called mr merkel owner of diamond x and other ranches he was superintending the round-up of his herds and those entrusted to bud nought and dick in the first business venture of the boy ranchers sit on him yelled bud's father accordingly the men sat on the calf thus with the holds they had secured keeping it under restraint with the least possible pain to the small creature branding iron sang out slim degnan foreman of the ranch a little blaze was flickering on the ground not far from where the calf nought had cut out was thrown and held in a moment the fire-tender had seized the branding iron and a second or two later it was being pressed on the calf's flank the creature bawled loudly and kicked out thereby nearly throwing off the men who were sitting on it but the branding was all over in a moment and the men leaped up releasing the animal the calf stood dazed for the time being after it had scrambled to its feet and then trotted out of the corral lashing its side with its little tail plainly branded on it now never to be completely effaced was the mark of the ownership of mr merkel an x inside a diamond next called the branders here comes dick shouted bud as nought rode up beside him and he got his calf 
good exclaimed the brother i guess we're learning the business surest thing you know asserted the son of the owner of diamond x i told you it wasn't so hard and you've done the same thing before but not such a big round-up remarked nought as he prepared to ride in again and cut out another calf yes it is big admitted bud as he made ready for his share in the affair his task being the same as that of his cousins to cut out the calves for branding purposes it sure is a big round-up it had been in progress for days twice a year on the big western ranches the cattle are driven in from the outlying ranges to be tallied inspected marked and shipped away the spring and fall round-ups are always busy seasons at any ranch during the times between round-ups the new calves attained their growth but they needed to have branded into their hides the marks of their owners then too some yearlings escaped branding at times either by remaining out of sight at the round-up or in the attending confusion unbranded calves who had partly attained their growth were termed mavericks and when the herds of different owners mingled there was usually a division of the mavericks since it could not be accurately told who owned them the title maverick was derived from a stockman of that name whose practice was to claim all unbranded calves in the herd his cowboys would ride about cutting out the unmarked animals with the cool statement that's a maverick meaning that it belonged to their boss and so the name has commonly become associated with any half-grown unbranded calf mr merkel was the owner of several ranches square m triangle b and diamond x not to mention diamond x second or flume valley of which his son bud and the latter's cousins norton and richard shannon were the nominal proprietors the cattle from flume valley or happy valley as bud called it after the mystery of the underground water was solved were in the round-up with the others from his father's ranches for days preceding the lively doings i have just described the cowboys called in from distant ranges had driven the cattle toward the central assembling point the corrals at diamond x slowly the longhorns the shorthorns and the cattle with no horns at all had been hazed in from their feeding grounds toward diamond x the cowpunchers had galloped hard all day and they had ridden herd at night to keep the animals from straying at night this was not so hard for the animals were glad to rest during the darkness but during the day there was always some steer often more than one that wanted to run away from the herd as this might start a stampede it was necessary to drive the striker back and this was often enough a difficult task bud nought and dick had borne their share of this difficult round-up task and now when the thousand or more of steers calves and mavericks had been gathered at diamond x the work of tallying them branding those that were without marks and shipping away the best was well under way in and out of the herd rode the boy ranchers doing their best alongside of more seasoned punchers calves were cut out thrown and branded to be quickly released and again mingle with the herd oh i'm captain jinx of the horse marines one of the cowboys wiping the dust and sweat from his face with his big red silk handkerchief or rather neckerchief started this song it was taken up by half a score of loud voices yippee came in centaurian tones from yelling kid this is the life but as just then his pony slipped and he missed the throw he made for a calf it is doubtful if yelling kid felt as gay as he sounded hot work eh boys asked mr merkel when dick nought and bud rode past to get drinks of water but it's great all the same answered dick with shining eyes eyes that gleamed amid a face dark with the tan of the western sun and grimy with the dust of the western plains glad you like it commented the proprietor of diamond x as he kept on with his tallying how they come in slim he asked his foreman couldn't be better old bucktooth is doing a heap sight more than i ever dreamed a zuni could bud said that his old indian helper was up to snuff commented mr merkel i'm glad to know it heard anything from double z he asked 
and there was an anxious note in his voice. No, Hank and his gang seem to have quieted down after what I told him. Well, I hope he doesn't make trouble for Bud and the boys. They're going back to Happy Valley tonight. So I understand. Oh, shucks, don't worry about Hank. He's all talk. He and that blustery foreman of his, Ike Johnson. There had been a dispute between the cowboys of Diamond X and those of Double Z, a ranch owned by the notorious Hank Fisher, a few days before the round-up, the subject of dispute being the ownership of certain mavericks. It had ended with the triumph of Slim Degnan, foreman of Mr. Merkel's holdings. And so the round-up went on, the heat, the dust, the noise and confusion increasing, as calf after calf, maverick after maverick, was branded, and the steers to be shipped were cut out, to be hazed over to the railroad stockyards. And yet, with all the seeming confusion, there was order and system in the work. "'Well, I guess this is the last,' remarked Mr. Merkel to his son, as Bud and his cousins rode slowly up to the ranch house, when the final calf had been cut out and the tally made. "'You boys going back after grub?' yep answered bud but there was no enthusiasm in his voice he like his cousins was too tired for the day had been a gruelling one with the heat and hard work you sure did make out a whole lot better than i ever thought you would said mr merkel as he rode along with his son and nephews putting water into that valley made a big difference i should say so exclaimed bud our stock will lay over anything you will ship from any of your three ranches dad "'I wouldn't wonder but what you were right, bud. "'Well, let's wash up and eat.' "'One by one the cowboys drifted in, "'some singing ranch songs in spite of their weariness. "'Bud and his cousins were through with their meal first, "'and having persuaded his sister Nell "'to pack a basket of doughnuts, pie and cheese for him, "'Bud signalled to his cousins to join him out at the pony corral. "'Let's get an early start back to Happy Valley,' he urged. "'It's a long enough ride, anyhow.' "'You said it,' commented Nort. "'Well, there's one thing we don't have to worry about, "'and that is not finding any water running into the reservoir,' added Dick, "'as he slipped in through the gate and caught one of his ponies. "'Not Blackie, who was tied out from the round-up. "'Each cow-puncher, including the boy ranchers, "'had several animals in his string. "'No, I guess we solved the mystery of the water supply. "'We'll have no more trouble,' agreed Bud. The boy ranchers rode over the trail to their own camp. It was actually a camp, for permanent ranch buildings had not yet been erected in Happy Valley, though some were projected. Tents formed the abiding place of our heroes, and as they were only there during the summer months, the canvas shelters served very well indeed. The moon rose, shining down from a starlit sky, as the rough but faithful and sturdy cow ponies ambled along. Now the boy ranchers would be down in some swale or valley, and again topping one of the foothills which led to Buffalo Ridge or Snake Mountain, between which elevations lay Happy Valley, where the cattle of Diamond X second were quartered. "'There she is, the old camp,' murmured Dick, as they started down the slope which led to the collection of tents erected against the earthen and stone bank of the reservoir. "'And maybe I won't hit the hay,' exclaimed Bud with a yawn. "'We don't have to get up tomorrow until we're ready.' "'Oh, boy!' cried Nort in delight. They rode forward and were almost at their camp when Bud, who had trotted ahead, pulled his pony to a sudden stop and cried out, "'Hold on there! Who are you and where are you going?' At the same moment his cousin saw the moon gleaming on the forty-five gun which Bud drew from his holster. End of the Roundup Chapter 1 of The Boy Ranchers on the Trail Coffee Break 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org wisconsin unemployment benefit decisions by appeals tribunals nineteen forty two to nineteen forty five case forty two a two fifty two appeals tribunal decision six forty two 
the employer denied unemployment benefits claiming that the employee left his employment voluntarily without good cause attributable to the employer the commission deputy's initial determination sustained the employer's denial the employee appealed findings of fact the employee was an experienced woodsman and was employed by the employer to peel ties subsequently the employer learned through complaints from men in the mill that two young boys were working on the tie peeling job the employer investigated and found two of the employee's sons at work and the employee absent from the job the employer refused to allow the boys to continue to work because of the danger of injury at the time the employer was making his investigation the employee was at the courthouse registering for work with the representative of the public employment office on the following day the employee called at the employer's place of business and stated that he could not make any money at peeling ties that he was not going to peel ties any longer the employee never returned to the job the appeal tribunal therefore finds that the employee left his employment voluntarily without good cause attributable to the employer within the meaning of section 108.04 parenthesis 4 parenthesis b of the statutes decision the commission deputy's initial determination is affirmed benefits are denied accordingly code 16 b 3 b parenthesis 3 end of wisconsin employment benefits decision by appeals tribunes 1942 to 1945Coffee Break Collection 15, The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An account of several workhouses for employing and maintaining the poor. Published in 1725 limehouse hamlet stepney june 1724 here is a very handsome and commodious brick house built twenty-five years since for lodging the poor of this hamlet but was not applied to the present use till after the act of the ninth of king george was passed to encourage the setting up of workhouses when by a subscription among the principal inhabitants it was fitted up to receive the poor and was opened april twenty eighth seventeen twenty four the number of poor now in it are as follows twenty three men and women seven boys and girls in all thirty above half of them are unfit for labor but about a dozen of them are employed in picking oakum at which they earn about four or five shillings a week in the whole which is applied toward the maintenance of the house note well old ropes are bought for five shillings the hundred weight and the oakum is sold for twelve shillings the hundred weight the steward of the house is a pensioner of the hamlet and is allowed five pounds four shillings per annum beside his maintenance and lodging etc in the house but the principal care is in eight trustees and a cashier some of whom visit the house constantly once sometimes twice a week buy provisions and give all other necessary directions as to diet they have flesh four times a week and with it such roots as are in season and the steward having been a seafaring person feeds them after the method used on shipboard that is by joining four of them in a mess and the meat is boiled in three pound pieces one of which is a mess for four persons and the same course is observed for milk bread beer etc by this rate a poor person is maintained at the rate of two shillings ten pennies or three shillings per week 
including all petty disbursements and incidental charges even firing and lodging not excepted for the hamlet pay ten pounds per annum ground rent the children in this house are all young and helpless and therefore are sent to a school in the neighbourhood at the public charge till they are eight years of age and then they are bound out apprentices till the age of twenty-four according to the act of parliament note well this hamlet with some addition will become a distinct parish as soon as the church now building is finished end of an account of several workhouses for employing and maintaining the poor published in seventeen twenty five Coffee Break Collection 15, The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Work Which a Woman is Doing in the Slums. Of aristocratic birth and associations, she devotes all her time and effort to the poor and unfortunate of New York's East Side. No respecter of creed or sect, she carries sympathy and cheer wherever she finds it is needed. Tombs Prison, a favorite field. There is a thick crust around the cream of society in New York that stretches from the rims on either side almost to the middle, where can be found what we are pleased to call material for missions. In these benighted quarters are to be found the outcasts, according to the version of some mission workers. And yet, those of us who are outcasts in disrepute with those who have acquired a reputation for moral probity, must have something that is hopeful in us, must surely belong to the same human family. The trouble is to get the Pharisees to admit who are the Pharisees. The list would be as long and as distinguished as the one contained in that intensely interesting volume called Who's Who, but the publicans and the sinners have not been so favored with individualities that resound their deeds. You hear of them only through the settlement workers, the mission agents, the charitable societies, and then only in the manner of patronizing pity, of deep regret, as painful examples of depraved human nature. Occasionally, once or twice in a lifetime, you run across a man or a woman who has an almost divine sense of Christianity and insists upon a respectful appreciation of the fallen woman and the fallen man. If through some catastrophe the population of New York were brought to the necessity of eradicating class distinctions, there would be no room for the Pharisees. They would have to raise the publicans and sinners to their august level, or starve alone. In the meantime, the burden of the social problem is upon the outcasts, except for the help they may receive from some distinct individuality in the person of a man or a woman ordained by Providence to understand them. There are many expensive failures in the assumption of aid to these outcasts, for the best that comes to them is something they achieve for each other, the sympathy of wrong for wrong, of hunger for hunger, of the starved for the starving. A Beautiful Personality in the Slums This only by way of preliminary introduction, in order that the personality of a woman who is facing the problem alone may be made comprehensive. The fact that she is an aristocrat with a title may seem to add luster to her good deeds, but she herself does not see it that way. She goes into the slums and the prisons and the mission rooms, an entire stranger to everyone. I only wish to help. It really makes no difference who I am, she says if they question her, and then she sings to them with a wonderful soprano voice that has evidently been trained by some great teacher, and goes, as quietly as she came, unknown. She is tall, dark, with exceptional beauty and unwearying vigor. Her manner, her voice, her assurance are indications of her birth and breeding, though she herself would be the last in the world to observe them. She has no affiliation with any charity or mission. She works silently, quietly, by personal and private contact with the outcasts. Full of a womanly pity. In private life, she is the Countess von Bus Ferrer, her husband is a nephew of Archdeacon Ferrer, but the title is hers, not his. She is of the old German family of Bus Zewaldeck. It is very difficult for me to talk about myself, she said, 
but I begin to see that I cannot supply all the needs that I find in my work unless I let people know what I am doing and why I am doing it. The Countess was modestly dressed, though richly, and while admitting that her personal income was hardly big enough to take care of the interests of the poor and the unfortunate, she indicated that what she had, she gave. But the material side of her practical charity was the least feature of importance in the talk, because, although the Countess kept close to the effective means of immediate relief to the suffering, there was behind all this the remarkable fitness of woman for the task of indiscriminate pity and kindness. "'Why do you spend your time in the slums and the prisons?' she was asked. To the worldly wise, it would seem she is putting away from her a world of pleasure, such as is the inheritance of the fortunate ones only. The countess smiled with a slightly disdainful, tolerant smile at the question. It is my way of life, she said. There are other ways and other duties, perhaps, but it is my way. You have always cared for the outcasts? You speak of very intimate things when you ask me that. I believe in kindness and love above all things, for the unfortunate, the poor, the outcast by conditions that have driven them to their misfortune. When I was a child, if a holiday was given me, I would ask my father to order the carriage, and after filling baskets with food and clothes, we would spend the day together, giving them away. But that is a very tender recollection. I cannot speak about it. She brushed her eyes, suspiciously moist, with the tips of her fingers. But what some would put down to sentimentalism was merely evidence of a heart big enough for pity. The Countess is not at all the type of the mission worker, charitable officer, or settlement agent, because she gives first aid to the injured without question and without criticism. You have no religious preference? None whatever. I am quite impartial, she said, with a slightly intolerant note in her voice for the creeds that open fresh wounds in the heart of charity. I can go to Catholic and Protestant, Jew and Gentile with equal purpose. If a man is hungry, give him food. If he is cold, give him clothes. If he is ill, nurse his poor body back to health. But there is danger of being deceived in all this. Oh, yes, but there is no mistaking hunger and exposure and sickness, is there? Of course, I do not tell them my name, and I do not ask them to pray for the things they need, nor do I insist upon being heard while I preach. Spurgeon was right when he said, If you go out to save souls, take your pocketbook with you. It is not their souls you are after. Perhaps it does not seem so, but... As I believe that there is innate good in everyone, there is really nothing to save. There is only to nourish and encourage and hearten the poor outcasts, who in their confusion have lost the way. What of the hardened criminal? Your hardened criminal is not such a problem, if his enemy society will treat him with friendliness and kindness. If you frown upon a man, you exile him. If you exile him, how can he live in a community that denies him his bread? There are shadows of our own making— and shadows that are made for us. Why not destroy them with a little optimism, a little cheerfulness, a little faith in human nature? I have not been so occupied with men and women who have had long terms in prison as with the short-term prisoners, the accidental criminals, the Magdalens of the street. Why are we always analyzing and condemning the fallen woman when there is the fallen man to consider as well? Of course I make no distinction as to those I can help, but the fallen man seems to me of greater importance. Because he is the stronger, the loss to the community is the greater, and so the reason of restoring him is more satisfying. Why young men go wrong? The fallen man is redeemable? To begin with, most of our prisons are filled with young men who have done wrong because they had no one to sympathize with their lonely struggles in big cities. New York, for instance, is the center of the world's interest. Young men crowd in here from the country, from Europe, from everywhere, to gratify their ambitions, to achieve wealth and success. The little money they bring with them is soon exhausted, and they drift. Drifting is idleness, enforced idleness frequently, and then comes mischief, the temptations of environment, and they get into prison, much as a bird is caught in a trap, and then there is no consoling explanation for them. The prisons have many eager, persevering, industrious young men who are amazed at their own misfortune at the lack of sympathy which the world shows to the unfortunate. They are condemned, sentenced, and society approves without really judging the merits of the case. Are the fallen men always young? Chiefly, although in the mission rooms, where one sees the utterly disheartened and poverty-stricken specimens, there are many middle-aged men. The middle-aged man finds himself a street wreck because he has been profligate, 
and sometimes because he has been the victim of the society that pronounces him an outcast. The outcast and the criminal are not of one source. There is a soul in each of them, equal to the demand of every moral appeal. But how is that appeal usually made? I attended a meeting at the Bowery Mission one very wet night this week. I sang for over five hundred homeless men. They were dirty, hungry, without shelter, without sleep. The odor in the room was stifling, terrible. Well, they were preached to, urged to think of their souls and everlasting punishment for sin. Their poor souls, how could they know where they were, embedded in dirt and pain and starvation of body? When the meeting was over, they went out as they had come in, degraded outcasts of society. Where do you suppose they went? What became of them? Even the lodging houses charge what to them was a fabulous sum, since they had nothing. After nights in the street, and days in hunger and dirt, is it any wonder that they become enemies to law and order? What they need is nourishment, clothes, shelter, that they may have a chance to find out if they really have souls or not. But what of the causes that bring men to such depths? Is there any time to look into the causes of hunger until the man has been fed? It is all in the cruelty of our point of view. If we deny to these men their human right to survive, if we refuse to nourish them unconditionally, how can we hope to lift the outcast back on his feet? You know, after all, outcasts are not born. They are the wounded in battle. And we should extend to them first aid to the injured, without moralizing, but with the practical efficiency of a practical civilization. There is too much of the instinct to punish, too little of the instinct of mercy in the big cities. Is the breadline a sincere appeal of hungry men or of idle men? Hunger is hunger. It has nothing to do with one's morals. It has to do with the necessities of daily life. If we starve, we die, and it is more important always to live. Problem of the Breadline A man once said to me of this breadline, If I had my way, I would arrest every one of those men and fence them in and put dogs at the entrances to keep everyone away from them. That is the attitude of society toward the outcast. It is because I believe in the inherent good and the existence of a soul in all men and women that I prefer to do what I can for the outcast without asking questions. You do not exempt the criminal from his claim on your charity? The criminal is not always born, if ever. He is the weaker, the less competent, the least capable of survival in the struggle for life. He is not necessarily idle. He is merely short-sighted and singularly at sea for standards and help. The educated man who becomes an outcast is, of course, in greater danger of prison than the uneducated. A college graduate, for instance, drifts through failure to grapple successfully with the bread-and-butter problem into the slums. He spends a night or two on the streets, and he starves himself rather than let his friends know that he is in need. Presently he gets into a dreary, wandering state of mind through exposure and sleeplessness. Is it any wonder that he steals or falls into some trap that in his normal world, where he started in life, he would have seen clearly and avoided? Just think what a little food and shelter would have done for that poor fellow in time. But a term in prison is the social remedy. It is not the best remedy, if any at all. He spends three, five, seven, twelve years in confinement, and he comes out a sick and broken man. But the world looks at him askance and says, Well, if he will work harder than other men for less pay, perhaps we will reinstate him. Is he fit to work? Has society left him capable of an even footing ever again? He has been badly nourished, kept in the gloom of a stone cell without sufficient exercise, and instead of work he wants help, nursing, quiet, and a bit of hope that is cheerful. Because the doctor tells a patient after a long illness that he can sit up, he does not mean that the man can go to work. The prisons are too severe? As to that, my experience with the ex-convict does not seem to leave much doubt. I have certain plans to test the theory of environment that the criminologists insist is not so great a cause of crime as heredity. It still seems to me that there is good, much good, in every human being, so I should like to dispose of the idea of the inherited criminal instinct. I have secured from the Salvation Army a plot of ground, seventy-five acres, at Spring Valley, New York, where I hope to build a home for the children of criminals, a place where they will be brought up to think better of their parents than society does, where they will never be reminded of the shame that is ascribed to them. There they will attend classes in industrial labor, and in this way, perhaps, we shall attack the root and seed of criminal records. It will cost a good deal of money, and I cannot do it all myself. 
but it is a project in which a committee of the Salvation Army is already interested. The Countess, in quest of her solution of the criminal problem, has been visiting the tomb's prison almost daily. On Sundays she sings to the prisoners, and as her voice has led to many offers for operatic stage, the prisoners are fortunate. She will always sing only for the outcasts, she says. Her voice and her purse belong to them. What do you sing in the missions? Always old-fashioned hymns, she said with a quiet smile. And what do you talk to the prisoners about? A Countess Visits Prisoners Very quietly the Countess tried to outline the detail of her work. I put my hands through the bars and shake hands with prisoners in their cells. Usually I bring with me some little dainties that they have not had the money to buy. Then I give them magazines and newspapers, but I do not intrude upon their private matters or their cases, unless they offer to talk to me about them. I never talk about religion, I merely make friends, and help the unfortunates to bear the burden as cheerfully as possible. As I left this remarkable countess, with a realization that her Christianity was an unbounded field of charity, she urged upon me her regret that there should be any publicity about herself. Say nothing about me, except that I need clothes for the poor, old clothes. Thanksgiving is coming, and Christmas, and winter, and how I am going to take care of them all, I don't know. End of Work Which a Woman is Doing in the Slums Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Descent of Man by Edith Wharton Chapter 6 The professor all the while was leading a double life. While the author of The Vital Thing reaped the fruits of popular approval, the distinguished microscopist continued his laboratory work unheeded, save by the few who were engaged in the same line of investigations. His divided allegiance had not hitherto affected the quality of his work. It seemed to him that he returned to the laboratory with greater zest after an afternoon in a drawing-room, where readings from The Vital Thing had alternated with plantation melodies and tea. He had long ceased to concern himself with what his colleagues thought of his literary career. Of the few whom he frequented, none had referred to the vital thing, and he knew enough of their lives to guess that their silence might as fairly be attributed to indifference as to disapproval. They were intensely interested in the professor's views on beetles, but they really cared very little what he thought of the Almighty. The professor entirely shared their feelings, and one of his chief reasons for cultivating the success which accident had bestowed on him was that it enabled him to command a greater range of appliances for his real work. He had known what it was to lack books and instruments, and the vital thing was the magic wand which summoned them to his aid. For some time he had been feeling his way along the edge of a discovery balancing himself with professional skill on a plank of hypothesis flung across an abyss of uncertainty. The conjecture was the result of years of patient gathering of facts. Its corroboration would take months more of comparison and classification. But at the end of the vista, victory loomed. The professor felt within himself that assurance of ultimate justification which, to the man of science, makes a lifetime seem the mere comma between premise and deduction, but he had reached the point where his conjectures required formulation. It was only by giving them expression, by exposing them to the common and criticism of his associates, that he could test their final value, and this inner assurance was confirmed by the only friend whose confidence he invited. Professor Pease, the husband of the lady who had opened Mrs. Linyard's eyes to the triumph of the vital thing, was the repository of her husband's scientific experiences. What he thought of the vital thing had never been divulged, and he was capable of such vast exclusions that it was quite possible that pervasive work had not yet reached him. In any case, it was not likely to affect his judgment of the author's professional capacity. You want to put that all in a book, Linyard, was Professor Peace's summing up, I'm sure you've got hold of something big. 
but to see it clearly yourself you ought to outline it for others. Take my advice. Chuck everything else and get to work tomorrow. It's time you wrote a book anyhow. It's time you wrote a book anyhow. The words smote the professor with mingled pain and ecstasy. He could have wept over their significance. But his friend's other phrase reminded him with a start of harvest. You have got hold of a big thing. It had been the publisher's first comment on the vital thing. But what a world of meaning lay between the two phrases. It was the world in which the powers who fought for the professor were destined to wage their final battle. And for the moment he had no doubt of the outcome. The next day he went to town to see Harvis. He wanted to ask for an advance on the new popular edition of The Vital Thing. He had determined to drop a course of supplementary lectures at the university, and to give himself up for a year to his book. To do this, additional funds were necessary. But, thanks to The Vital Thing, they would be forthcoming. The publisher received him as cordially as usual, but the response to his demand was not as prompt as his previous experience had entitled him to expect. Of course, we'll be glad to do what we can for you, Lanyard, but the fact is we've decided to give up the idea of the new edition for the present. You've given up the new edition? Why, yes, we've done pretty well by the vital thing, and we're inclined to think it's your turn to do something for it now. The professor looked at him blankly. What can I do for it? he asked. What more? his accent added. Why, put a little new life in it by writing something else. The secret of perpetual motion hasn't been discovered, you know, and it's one of the laws of literature that books which start with a rush are apt to slow down sooner than the crawlers. We've kept the vital thing going for eighteen months, but, hang it, it ain't so vital any more. We simply couldn't see our way to a new edition. Oh, I don't say it's dead yet, but it's moribund, and you're the only man who can resuscitate it. The professor continued to stare. I... What can I do about it? He stammered. Do? Why write another like it? Go at one better. You know the trick. The public isn't tired of you by any means, but you want to make yourself hurt again before anybody else cuts in. Write another book. Write two and we'll sell them in sets in a box. The Vital Thing series. That will take tremendously in the holidays. Try and let us have a new volume by October. I'll be glad to give you a big advance if you'll sign a contract on that. The professor sat silent. There was too cruel an irony in the coincidence. Harvest looked up at him in surprise. Well, what's the matter with taking my advice? You're not going out of literature, are you? The professor rose from his chair. No, I'm going into it, he said simply. Going into it? I'm going to write a real book, a serious one. Good Lord, most people think the vital thing serious. Yes, but I mean something different. In your old line, beetles and so forth? Yes, said the professor solemnly. Harvest looked at him with equal gravity. Well, I'm sorry for that, he said, because it takes you out of our bailiwick. But I suppose you've made enough money out of the vital thing to permit yourself a little harmless amusement. When you want more cash, come back to us. Only don't put it off too long or some other fellow will have stepped into your shoes. Popularity don't keep, you know, and the hotter the success, the quicker the commodity perishes. He leaned back, cheerful and sententious, delivering his axioms with conscious kindliness. The professor, who had risen and moved to the door, turned back with a wavering step. When did you say another volume would have to be ready? he faltered. I said October, but call it a month later. You don't need any pushing nowadays. And you'd have no objection to letting me have a little advance now? I need some new instruments for my real work. Harvis extended a cordial hand. My dear fellow, that's the talking. I'll write the check while you wait, and I dare say we can start up the cheap edition of The Vital Thing at the same time, if you'll pledge yourself to give us the book by November. How much? he asked, poised above his checkbook. In the street the professor stood staring about him, uncertain and a little dazed. After all, 
"'It's only putting it off for six months,' he said to himself, "'and I can do better work when I get my new instruments.' He smiled and raised his hat to the passing Victoria of a lady in whose copy of the vital thing he had recently written, Labor es etiam ipsa voluptus. End of the Descent of Man Recording by Philip Gould